Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the council meeting. The first item on the agenda is going to be apologies for absence. Over to you, Mr. Edwards, please. Thank you, presiding member. I have apologies from councillors Mike Day, Kerry Evans, Mary Jones, Elliot King, Erica Kirshner, Richard Lewis, Peter May, and Francesca O'Brien. Any others? Uh, yes, Terry Hennigan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Evans. The next item is disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests. I'll hand you over to Tracy Meredith, please. Thank you, Presiding Member. Two items that I want to bring to your attention tonight. Firstly, Agenda Item 8, which is the Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Authority presentation. I know a number of you wish to declare an interest as members of the Fire Authority, but I can advise you that this item has been withdrawn at the re request of the Chief Fire Officer, so there's no need to make a declaration of interest for Agenda Item 8. And then, in relation to the Notice of Motion and Nuclear Free Wales, some of you may be members of campaign organisations or lobby, lobby groups. So I'm thinking of things like CND. If you are, then I would suggest that you declare a personal interest only. Um, I don't know how many of you that will affect, so I'll take a block declaration. So a block declaration, personal interest only for the notice of motion on the basis that you may be a member of CND or a similar campaign or lobby group. So if you could raise your hands, please. Virtual hands if you're attending remotely. Thank you. Yep, hands up, personal, personal interest only. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, please, I'll have to use this. Well, perhaps ask a question. I, I was a member of the council, the city council, that actually made Swansea a nuclear-free zone at the time, and I voted in favour of that. Um, so have I, have, have I got an interest or not? Councillor, as long as you've not predetermined your decision on the notice of motion, then that's fine. You have to keep an open mind. Are there any other um, declarations of interest on the items on the agenda? Item 14 um, is personal and prejudices. I know the gentleman very, very well. Thank you. Me too. Who said me too? Sorry. Nicola. Oh, it's Nicola behind us. Sorry. It's Nicola Matthews. Okay. <laughs> so Nicola Matthews, personal and prejudicial interest. So you'll need to leave the um, virtual meeting. And Andrew, students. Yeah, I got a, a personal prejudicial interest in item 14 as well, then. Okay, we move on to the minutes then, and that's to approve and sign the minutes of the previous. Sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is not on the uh, at attendance. If you, if you just wait a minute, I'm just going to announce it, uh, Councillor Anderson. You're, okay. you're, you're predetermining what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. okay. Chair, Chair. Item 14, uh, I know Carlo as well. For you. Uh... Yeah. Yes. OK, go back to the minutes. And there is one alteration, and that's to uh, subject to councillors uh, Cyril Anderson and P uh, Mr. Peter, sorry, councillor Peter Black being added to as being present. OK, so do you want me to go through them page by page? It's page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All approved? Move. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the written responses to council asked uh, questions asked at the last ordinary meeting of council, and that's on pages nine and ten. Then we have the announcements of the presiding member. So my I've only got one announcement tonight, and that's to congratulate the Council for winning the best commercialisation and entrepreneurship initiative at the APSI Awards 2022 with the Swansea Market at the heart of the city centre and local economy initiative. So well done to everybody. Okay. 
The next is the announcements of the leader. Over to you, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, uh, on behalf of the Council, obviously, to wish uh, the Wales uh, women's football team uh, all the very best of luck in their match against her to Bosnia Herzegovina in the semi final playoffs in Cardiff this evening. So I'm sure we all wish the team well there. Uh, my second announcement is uh, just to, uh, I guess, reflect on the fact that um, we all, I, th I think, uh, probably sat in aghast at, uh, at the implications and, and impacts of the, the recent fiscal adjustment or mini budget, as everybody else knows it, recently. And I just wanted to relay to Council that whilst um, we would all have views about whether that was a sensible move or not, and I certainly think it wasn't. Um, we are now left with the aftermath of that. And I just wanted to report that um, members will be aware that there's been a significant impact on the valuation of the pound versus the dollar. And whilst those sort of things rarely worry people unless they're going on holidays, um, the reality is that we buy our energy in dollars, as everybody else does, because energy is traded in dollars. And we were already uh, looking at increases in energy as many households have been across the country. The direct result of that impact of the mini budget has been to drive the pound lower against the dollar. That has further raised the pressure on our energy bills. And you know, I can report to Council this evening that currently we are looking at an energy gap next year of £20 million in this authority alone. Now, if you multiply that across Wales, you will see that there's a, an energy gap then unfunded currently of hundreds of millions of pounds. Now, very grateful to the UK government for um, their current statements on energy, which I'm sure households will appreciate. But just to be clear, that does nothing for this council or for any council in Wales, because we are already on a pre-bought deal for this year. So we're below the cap. So uh, I would ask that uh, those who may have influence uh, with UK government take the opportunity to join us in lobbying for the cap to be extended past the 1st of March, because if it doesn't, then we are left with an unfunded £20 million bill in this authority. And £10 million of that is directly uh, bills that schools would have to pick up, because obviously half our energy bill is spent in the school's estate. My, my final thing is obviously to to again say I really wish that uh, the decisions that have been made in London had been thought through because uh, we've had many debates and, and Councillor Jones has, uh, has we've sparred across the chamber a few times in terms of the cost of borrowing. Councillor Jeff Jones I should say because obviously Mary would, <laughs> would make me uh, point out who I'm talking to. Uh, Jeff Jones but I think you know we should commend Mr Smith for the decisions he took uh, a year or so ago now where we were locked in our borrowing at what is now a very attractive rate of 1.96%. If Mr Smith was going to the markets now, he'd be looking at rates three times that, and that is a direct impact of the budget uh, announced in London. But of course, it's not just our borrowing that's gone up, it's the borrowing of anybody looking for a mortgage deal at the moment, or anybody whose fixed rate mortgage deal is ending. Thousands of products have been removed from the market as a result of the mini budget, and as of yesterday, the fixed rate deal that you could get is now at 6%. So whereas previously, before the budget, you could have had a fixed rate deal of a th around 3%, households are now looking at a minimum of 6% uh, for, for their deals. And, and that is that is going to outstrip any help on energy. So I'm sure it's not what the government wanted to happen. But, you know, it's a reality and they now have to work doubly hard to make sure that people can get through what's going to be a very difficult winter. And I just want to repeat what we've said uh, as a local council. We will continue to put out the help that we can to help people through the worst of the storm that is coming. My final one, uh, Chair, is a, is, is a more positive one. Um, members will know that we made a commitment some time ago to become uh, a defib friendly city and we've done uh, a, a great job of getting a, a load of uh, additional 24 hour access uh, defibs uh, out across uh, Swansea. Um, 30,000 um, out of hospital cardiac arrests occur every year. So it's important that even though we've got the kit out there, that people know how to use uh, the defibs if they're if they're needed to, to use one. And I'm pleased to say that we've been able to um, agree with 
uh, heart, sorry, um, the charity called Restart a Heart to provide uh, CPR and defibrillator training um, to uh, all members free of charge. So if members would like to take up that offer, we'll get Mr. Evans, uh, we'll be sending our own note in due course uh, where you'll be able to take uh, the advantage of the free uh, defib training. And again, my, my thanks to Councillor Lewis, who's worked with the charity um, to ensure that we we really do um, deliver on our aims of becoming uh, the UK's most defib friendly city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Leader. The next is the public questions, and I need to call on Mary Jones of Swansea CND, please. It's the one with the hand on, sir. Oh. OK, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, does the Council Leader agree with me that with Vlad uh, Vladimir Putin escalating his illegal invasion of Ukraine uh, with nuclear threats, which are risking nuclear war, uh, that this current crisis makes very clear that the only guaranteed way to avoid nuclear war in the future is to abolish all nuclear weapons? and that we must all now work with the United Nations to build nuclear ban communities everywhere. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones, for that question. I'll, okay. I mean, my, my um, immediate response is, yes, of course, uh, a world without nuclear weapons would be a much safer world, especially when you've got um, uh, people like Vladimir Putin in it who uh, continue to uh, state that they would uh, you know, consider the use of nuclear weapons. But I, I'll hand over to uh, Councillor Gibbard, who's obviously the author of the, the motion that we're bringing this evening, to say a little bit more, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Thank you for the question. I, I, I don't want to sort of preempt too much of what I'm going to say later when I when I move the motion, but so the short answer is yes, I do agree. Um, you know, it's the increasingly dangerous actions and rhetoric of, of Putin are escalating tensions and potentially edging us closer to nuclear war. And if Putin does, heaven forbid, deploy nuclear weapons in Ukraine, where does that leave us and our allies in terms of our response? And I'm sure nobody wants uh, a nuclear war. And I simply put, the only way to avoid nuclear war is to not have nuclear weapons. So now more than ever, we should be working together internationally as, around the world to make that a reality. Chair, I was, I was going to make a suggestion. Yes, yes, sorry, yes, sorry. Yes, certainly. So, Chair, I was going to suggest, seeing as that we do not have the uh, presentation from the Mid and West Wales uh, Fire Service, and we've got a number of uh, members of the public in the gallery, perhaps after we've had the Governance and Audit Committee report, we could bring forward the notice of motion as the next item, if that would be acceptable to, co to Council. <laughs> Okay, the next item, next item is the Governance and Audit Committee Annual Report. And I'd like to call on Paula O'Connor, Chair of Governance and Ordinance Committee, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to present this report to the full council. Um, the report outlines how the Governance and Audit Committee has fulfilled the terms of reference and it also contains the details, issues and developments that have been undertaken during 21-22. Um, I don't intend to go through the report in detail page by page. I will assume that you've read the report. Um, but if I could just um, focus on a couple of things within that report. Um, firstly, it's the developments. Um, Council will be aware that um, the membership and the roles of the Governance and Audit Committee has changed to meet the requirements of the Local Government and Election Wales Act 2021. There are now 10 councillors and four lay members, and work is progressing to, to uh, fill the additional lay member post. And I believe discussions are ongoing um, as, as we speak. Um, the additional roles of the committee now includes the review of performance and also the review of the council's ability to manage complaints. As a result of this, uh, as a chair, I've liaised with Councillor Chris Hawley, who's the Chair of Scrutiny and Performance Board, to ensure that there's clarity and harmony of the responsibilities of the committee and also the service board. Similarly, with regards to the work of the Scrutiny Committee, um, as Chair of Governance and Audit, um, I've 
continually liaise with Councillor Peter Black, the chair of the Scrutiny Committee, and I'm delighted a number of the members on the Governance and Audit Committee are also members on the Scrutiny uh, Committee. And again, we will ensure that the work programmes of both of those committees reflect the appropriate information that's needed in both of those, recognising the different roles that we both have to play. Um, matters we've discussed are outlined in the report during the course of the 12 months, and in particular, the absence of the workforce strategy, uh, which was in play until February 2022. Delighted that that's now come into play and will continually um, develop itself alongside the um, delivery plans and the uh, su su successful put my teeth in, and sustainable Swansea. Um, in addition to that, the ongoing development of the Council's risk management arrangements are, are certainly improved, but there's still a little way to go before they're fully embedded. So those are the key things that came through during the year, but certainly a huge amount of progress has been made in, a, in, a, in an arena that's been very difficult to, 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 to work with, with the COVID and post-COVID. Um, so my congratulations go out to, to, to everyone concerned with the work. Um, Similarly, the assurances that we've received have been welcomed, and that's come mainly from your Chief Auditor, Simon Cockings, and the internal audit service that's been provided. Also, your external auditors, Audit Wales, we've received numerous reports from them, all of which have been very positive. Um, and I also need to thank Councillor Leslie Walton, who's, who was sat on the uh, Governance Working Group, uh, to ensure that the annual governance statement and the population of that report has had due rigour and is, is complete and accurate in all regards. Um, that, that work is fed back in through the Governance and Audit Committee by Councillor Walton. And again, I'm thankful for her, her efforts with that. Um, looking forward, um, obviously, it's going to be another challenging year. Um, we've got a robust delivery um, training programme for the Governance and Audit Committee to make sure we're focusing on the right things and be reminded of the work that's going on in other committees within the local authority. Um, the annual governance statement obviously will reflect the areas of concern that I've mentioned. Uh, but finally, I just want to thank members of the Governance and Audit Committee. I won't name them all. Um, but particularly the Vice Chair for his support throughout the period and to all members for their, their engagement and their commitment to the work of that committee. Um, and obviously, I mentioned the Chief Internal Auditor and his team for working under the pressure that they've worked to deliver the plan and all officers of the Council. I mean, democratic services have been you know, really sound in, in supporting us. Ben Smith, without saying, um, and generally all officers that I've engaged with, most recently Ness Young, um, which I'm looking forward to working with, and also to Martin for his early engagement um, in his interim post. So I'd have no more to say on that report, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Paula, please? No, I'm going to call on Councillor Stewart then, please. Yeah, Chair, thank you very much. Can I just uh, pay tribute to... Uh, the chair of the committee and thank you and the committee for the work that you've undertaken again this year. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right to make the point that uh, it's important that uh, the Audit and Governance Committee is aware of the work that's being done elsewhere in scrutiny and that there isn't that overlap, that they that, that they have, uh, you know, continue to focus on the important uh, uh, elements. Um, and just, you know, on a personal note, I know it's a, a difficult time for you to be here today and thank you very much thank you. and uh, wish you all the best. Obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lydia. OK, we move to item 17 forward then, and that's the notice of motion. And can I call so, on... Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Chair, sorry? I got my hand up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Parkson. Uh, thank you, Madam President, Officer. But members will have seen this is a very comprehensive report reflecting the work of the Audit Committee in 2021-2022. And can I thank the Chairman and officers for his preparation? Having read it, members will have realised how important and effective this committee is now. I've been a member of the Audit Committee over many years and I've seen it evolve into what I think is an increasingly effective committee. It has gone from just receiving internal audit reports and monitoring of the overall financial situation of the Council to a situation where every senior Council officer will be aware that if a department gets an adverse internal audit report, 
they will have to come before the audit committee. Moreover, council financial data is now far more deeply scrutinised by the committee, and there's now a real monitoring of performance and the council's risk assessments procedures and a requirement for senior managers to provide assurance that all major risks are being addressed. Apart from legislation, the continual enhancement involvement in the role of this audit committee uh, as far as I'm concerned, has largely been driven by the two lay chairmen, initially Mr. Alan Thomas and now Mrs. Paul, Mrs. Paul O'Connor. I'm sure that members will agree with me when I express our appreciation of their work in developing the effectiveness of this audit committee. Thank you, Madam, Pre Madam President Officer. Uh, thank you, Councillor Paxton-Williams. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, we move on. Item 17 then, and that's the notice and motion. And I'd like to call on the proposer, Councillor Louise Gibbard, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. In 1982, local authorities around Wales refused a UK government instruction to draw up civil defence plans, including the establishment of nuclear bunkers from which the aftermath of a nuclear war would be managed. After opposition to the government's plans, all eight county councils eventually refused to participate, including our predecessor, West Glamorgan. I think some people here today were involved in that, and passed resolutions declaring themselves nuclear-free zones. The Nuclear Free Wales Declaration emphasised that the whole of Wales was declared a nuclear-free zone and that the people of Wales wished to live in peace without the threat of nuclear war. Sadly, 40 years later, that threat is still with us. In a speech on the 21st of, September, 21st of September, Vladimir Putin made his most aggressive and explicit threats to date, promising to use nuclear weapons in the event of a threat to what he describes as the territorial integrity of Russia and to defend its people. With the sham referendums held in areas of occupied territory in Ukraine, there's now a very real concern that attempts to liberate these areas could provoke a nuclear response. Let me be absolutely clear how completely devastating and catastrophic this would be. Even so-called tactical nuclear weapons of the kind that some commentators speculate might be used in the Ukraine conflict typically have explosive yields in the range of 10 to 100 kilotons. In comparison, the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945, killing 140,000 people, had a yield of just 15 kilotons. A single nuclear detonation would kill, likely kill hundreds of thousands of civilians, injure many more, with radioactive fallout that could contaminate large areas across multiple countries. It will create mass panic, huge displacement of people, and immeasurable economic cost. The only way to keep humanity safe from this is to work together, collectively and collaboratively across the world to denuclearize now more than ever. Possession of nuclear weapons doesn't keep us safe. The UK should be leading the way and joining 130 nations who have so far signed the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. As CND Cymru says, the treaty is not a magic solution to get rid of nuclear weapons, but it's one tool amongst many that can and should be used to make progress towards a nuclear-free world. In 2019, the UK spent £13,917 every minute on nuclear weapons. Just think how that money could be better spent on tackling climate change, alleviating poverty, on world peace. I'm asking fellow councillors today to support this motion and put Swansea's name to the growing list of ICANN cities. Boston, New York, Manchester, Leeds, Edinburgh, Brisbane, Canberra, Toronto, Paris, Berlin, the list goes on. We're a city of sanctuary. We're becoming a city of human rights. Let's be a city committed to peace too. Can I call on the leaders a second, please? Thank, thank you, Chair. I obviously associate uh, with everything that Councillor Gibbard has said and, and many of the examples that Councillor Gibbard has used, I, I was going to reference, but I will I'll skip on to the point that, you know, nuclear weapons, um, uh, and the, the, what they bring, which is mutually assured destruction, is mad for a reason. I mean, it, it's, it's essentially the end of life as we know it. Nobody will win a nuclear conflict. And therefore, anything that the, the nations of the world can do to not only stop nuclear proliferation of weapons, but work towards the elimination of nuclear weapons so we all live in a safer world is absolutely something we should all be committed to. I, I applaud the decisions that previous councils have made, including our predecessor, in terms of making uh, the statement that Wales is a nuclear-free country. Uh, and just to be clear, that wasn't uh, a statement around 
uh, nuclear, including energy, it was about nuclear weapons. And again, it's just that just that clarity there. We're talking about nuclear weapons here. Obviously, we, uh, from an energy perspective, would resist uh, nuclear energy on the basis that we want to see investments in green renewable energy because nuclear energy is not cheap <laughs> and it's not uh, an easy source of energy to deal with. It has long term environmental impacts. So, um, but on to the main point of this, fully support this motion. I do hope uh, that we avoid the sort of catastrophe that uh, Putin continues to threaten. Uh, and we have to be strong and stand up. This isn't about unilateral nuclear disarmament either. That is not what the motion's about, but it's about us all working together to eliminate something that could end everybody's way of life. Leader, Councillor Holly. Thank you, Th thank you presiding member. I do not think there's a sane individual on this planet who believes that the prospect of a tactical nuclear weapon being used in the Ukraine is a good idea. I cannot believe that even the high command of the Russian government would ever contemplate it. The consequences are not just the blast, not just the radiation, it's the radiation spread across the world. When Chernobyl, an accident happened, there were sheep farmers in North Wales who could not sell their the flocks for years. And that was an accident in a power station where the reactors had shut down facilities. Setting one off deliberately is nothing, as the leader said, mad. It is absolutely crazy. And anyone who believes that that is possible is, I have to say, deranged. I do believe in this notice of motion. I think the wording is slightly wrong. It should be a nuclear weapon free zone because that's the reality of what it is. We are stuck with nuclear power, whether we like it or not. Because until someone comes up with a magic formula to turn water into energy, other than barrages, which apparently the government don't like, there is, we are stuck with nuclear power, and unfortunately, the, this, the wording of this should change to reflect that. We have tested nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Bikini Atoll and many others that took place in the Pacific and in the Russian steppes. The consequences of that were felt for 60 years afterwards. In those places and around the world, in the jet streams and what have you, that radiation was picked up. They stopped testing, they've gone underground. The weapons today, the nuclear weapons today, are 10 times more powerful than the ones that were tested. The new hydrogen type bombs that you have are so much more effective, for the want of a better term, than the ones that were used in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, are terrifying. And I think whatever can be done must be done to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. Yes, we have a treaty. But until that treaty is respected by every country around the world, we still have this problem. Of course, you know, I fully support this notice of motion. I think anyone who has any sort of sense and reason would support it but I would ask that it says nuclear weapon free world because that way we will not be hamstrung by anybody saying that we don't support nuclear power or we have voted for this and there's a nuclear power station on our corner, but I do support it. Councillor Gibbard, do you want to come back? I, I, I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, that. sorry, there's other questions. Okay. Grace? Sorry. The, the amendment is quite that amend Can I have a seconder then for that amendment, please? Okay. 
I'm happy, I'm happy to accept the nuclear weapon, which we, I thought is implicit in the wording, but no, okay. Be more okay, explicit. thank you. Do we need to take... Uh, Councillor Rice. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking for this motion as well. I, I want to tell you a little story. Um, about 12, 14 years ago, I think it was, I, I had the honour of going to Roshma and actually meeting somebody who survived the day of the bomb there. And it's probably one of the most moving things I've ever heard and, and spoken to somebody about. And uh, I can remember at the end of the lecture, I, I went back to the room to speak to the chap and he was an 80-year-old man who was organising his papers. And if anybody knows anything about Japanese culture, people are very um, closed and they, they don't want to show their emotions. And he stood there, not thinking that we could see him, arranging his papers and there were literally tears streaming from his eyes. And he said to me, he said, I can't, you know, I can't forget this. This happened as if it was like yesterday to me. And he said, I'll never get the ghosts of the people I saw out of my mind. And he said... If you can do anything, like anybody else, go and try and get nuclear weapons removed from this world. And I said to him on that day, Kanjiro, I'll do whatever I can. And so hopefully I see this as a promise kept. Councillor Lewis. Uh, thank you, presiding member, and thank you to Councillor Gibbard for bringing the notice of motion. I fully support uh, the principles of the notice of motion, but just wanted to uh, refer to the fact that, uh, and I speak in a personal capacity, that uh, I think it's sensible not to refer to nuclear power in the notice of motion, but we mustn't forget that nuclear power is also associated with nuclear weapons. Uh, actually, nuclear fission is a, a, you know, a product of radioactive materials that need to be disposed of, and that is unacceptable. Uh, and I, I fully support the leader's comments around we should be focused on renewable energy. However, um, we don't yet know the impact of nuclear fusion and nuclear fusion could create, uh, a, you know, uh, an absolute power energy source, which is, um, you know, unlimited. And we don't yet know what the radioactive fallout of that is. So I think it's sensible to leave it out of this notice of motion, but um, I, I would just be a word of caution because nuclear fission uh, creates terrible radioactive materials which have to be disposed of and buried, and they often want to bury them in Wales, as I remember. So I'm just adding that caveat uh, and reassured that nuclear fusion isn't excluded from this discussion. Is that an addition to the amendment? Or just no. or just a comment. Okay. Alison. Yeah, yeah. Um I just follow on from what Andrea was saying, you know, it, it doesn't seem that long ago. So only a, perhaps a year or two later, we were in the environmental centre and we were trying to stop, which we did succeed obviously in um not having nuclear waste dump during in Wales. You, you know, and we're very fortunate to have the buffer in many respects of the Welsh Assembly who stand with us on that and don't want anything to do with it you, you, you know now obviously i you, you know my my beliefs are as i put my hand up earlier with cnd cymru and cnd and i'm very passionate about not having anything to do with nuclear here in wales at all but as people have passionately spoken about you know we have to remember history we have to remember what people have been through we, we may not have experienced it ourselves, but we all know the horrors of the nuclear weapons. We know the the, the, the countries that have never recovered from it, the, the, the loss of lives. We call ourselves a civilised country, a civilised world. How on earth can we even be thinking about, um, you know, renewing Trident and investing billions? We've got crisis is coming up now, poverty galore. And yet we can find billions, billions and billions and billions for nuclear weapons. There's something seriously wrong, you, you know. So I 100% agree with this motion for a million reasons, you know. So thanks very much for bringing it. Thank you, Councillor Pugh. Councillor Engine Jones. 
But thank, thank you, uh, presiding member. <clears throat> Goes without saying that nobody wants, nobody in this country and in the world really wants to see the use of nuclear weapons. That goes without saying, uh, you know, uh, and, but it is a fact, like it or not, that you can only have security through strength. Uh, one goes hand in hand with the other. When you look at Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, it is clear that the only reason he has uh, not pushed that nuclear button is he fears the reaction of the West. And once they have that fear, they will not press that button. And that's why it is important for that money to be spent on defence, on nuclear weapons, uh, to keep our country safe. In your motion, you talk about diplomacy, but sadly, you cannot negotiate with Putin and tyrants like him. They only recognise strength and strength, not weakness. And to say we would not spend any money on nuclear weapons, uh, unfortunately, is a sign of weakness. And he would take it as that, absolutely take it as that. We live in an uncertain world. And in reality, like it or not, uh, the declaration of a nuclear free Wales is, was, I believe, misguided 40 years ago and certainly misguided now. Uh, when, and when you say about a nuclear free Wales, I'm pleased to hear that the, uh, the, the item about nuclear power has been taken out of that, because if we are to meet net zero, then we need nuclear power. But, you know, the UK is independent nuclear deterrent, which we spend that money on. It's our insurance for peace, has existed for over 60 years to, de to deter the most extreme threats to our national security and way of life helping to guarantee our safety and that of our NATO allies. The risk of nuclear conflicts remains remote, but the threat the UK faces and other countries are increasing in scale and complexity. That is why we must be able to deter the most extreme acts of aggression against us and our NATO allies. So therefore, I am not supporting this motion because it is vitally important. We have that nuclear deterrent. And as I say, 40 years ago, I think the motion was wrong. Uh, and, and, and it certainly is today in the world that we live in. But I would reiterate the fact none of us, none of us at all wants to see the use of nuclear weapons. But I believe the best way to see that they're not used is to have them as that insurance policy for peace. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Presiding Member, can I interrupt just, just to give uh, uh, Councillor Jones, uh, Lyndon Jones, a little bit of information about the nuclear independent nuclear deterrent. The, the reality of Trident and the reality of any nuclear weapon that the West possessed is in the hands of the President of the United States. Is there anyone who seriously thinks in the UK that we as a nation could launch one nuclear strike against another country without having the consent of the American government? For a start off, the missiles are regularly serviced in America. The nuclear weapons need to be serviced on a, on a yearly or two yearly basis. The idea that we are independent, the same as France, I'm very sorry, is not. If, if there's going to be a nuclear war, it is mad and it is across the world. It's nothing like independent, and that includes China and that crazy state, North, North Korea. So please do not think for one minute that our nuclear deterrent is an independent deterrent. It is dependent on the West's reaction to something. Okay. Good. Pardon? Good. Okay, Councillor Gibbard, you want to come back in, please? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's comments and thank you very much for the considered contributions. I'll just make a, a couple of points, if, if I may. Um, signing up to the treaty does not preclude us from continuing to be a member of, of NATO. Um, but uh, but the, and the fact is that it does that nuclear weapons just do not keep us safe. Putin may still press the button, um, as he's suggesting. And in any case, warfare is changing. It'd be better for us to look at the sort of changing nature of, of cyber warfare, uh, chemical warfare, all that kind of thing, which is which is which is 
going on. So potentially that would be much better spent our defence looking at that kind of thing. I think it's completely contradictory to say that the best way to not use nuclear weapons is to have nuclear weapons. It just seems seems uh, un- completely ridiculous. The existence of nuclear weapons makes us all more insecure and all less safe. Um, and so, the, you know, the very simple uh, the the very simple solution is to just denuclearize as a globe and and uh, take that out of the equation. Oh. Chair, I intend to call for a named vote on this item. Okay. On a point of order, Chairman, before you start, um, the normal convention would be if a member is not present for the whole of a debate, they shouldn't vote. Um, caught out as I was by the change to the agenda order, I arrived after this had started. So I won't be voting. I wouldn't want it to be considered that I was predetermined in any vote. However, I would like this chamber and anybody watching to understand that had I been here at the beginning, I would have been, I would have been voting for it. Okay. Over to you, uh, Mr. Edwards, for the English. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Prevailing Member. I am now going to read out councillors' names. Um, please say, uh, sorry, just to remind you, the the the, the, the notice of motion has uh, been amended. It's now for a nuclear weapons free wills. Um, I will read out your name and please simply say whether you're for, against, or abstain. I don't need any other words. Thank you very much, Councillor Cyril Anderson. For Councillor Matthew Bailey. For Councillor Sam Bennett. For Councillor Patience Bentu. Four. Councillor Peter Black. Four. Councillor John Curtis. Four. Councillor Adam Davis. Four. Councillor Mike Day is absent. Councillor Phil Downing. Four. Councillor Ryland Doyle. Councillor Mike Dirk. Councillor Kerry Evans. Councillor Chris Evans. Councillor Mandy Evans. Four. Councillor Wendy Fitzgerald. Councillor Rebecca Fogarty. Four. Councillor Robert Francis Davis. Four. Councillor Nicola Furlong. Four. Councillor Louise Gibbard. Four. Councillor Fiona Gordon. Four. Councillor Kevin Griffiths. Four. Councillor Hayley William. Four. Councillor Joe Hale. Four. Councillor Terry Hennigan. Councillor Victoria Holland. Four. Councillor Chris Holly. Four. Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. He's left the meeting. Councillor Beverly Hopkins. Four. Councillor David Hopkins. Four. Councillor Linda James. Four. Councillor Oliver James. Councillor Yvonne Jardine. Four. Councillor Alan Jeffrey. Four. Councillor Di Jenkins. Four. Councillor Jeff Jones. Four. Councillor Lyndon Jones. Against. Councillor Mary Jones. Sorry, give me a second. Councillor Matthew Jones. Councillor Susan Jones. Four. Councillor Sandra Joy. Four. Councillor Sarah Keaton. Four. Councillor Elliot King. Councillor um, Hannah Lawson. Four. Councillor Andrea Lewis. Four. Councillor Mike Lewis. Four. Councillor Richard, Councillor Wendy Lewis. Four. Councillor Paul Lloyd. Four. Councillor Michael Locke. Four. Councillor Nicola Matthews. Four. Councillor Penny Matthews. Not sure. Councillor Peter May. Councillor James McGettrick. Four. Councillor Hazel Morris. Councillor French, uh, Councillor Angela O'Connor, Councillor David Phillips. We, we thank you. You already voted. Yeah. 
Councillor Cheryl Philpott. Four. Councillor Jess Pritchard. Four. Councillor Sam Pritchard. Four. Councillor Alison Pill. Four. Councillor Stuart Rice. Four. Councillor Kelly Roberts. Four. Councillor Bridget Rowlands. Against. Councillor Robert Smith. Four. Councillor Andrew Stevens. Four. Councillor Rob Stewart. Four. Councillor Graham Thomas. Four. Councillor Will Thomas. Against. Against. Okay. Councillor Mark Tribe is absent. Councillor Gordon Walker. Councillor Leslie Wilton. Four. Councillor Mike White. Four. Councillor Andrew Williams. Four. Thank you all. That is 56 votes for, four votes against, no abstentions, but obviously um, I will record Councillor Phillips's. Uh, um, statement as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Okay, we move on to item 10 then, and that's the annual report of 2021 22 by the Director of Social Services. I'd like to call him Mr. David House, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Member. I'll stand if I may. Um, this is the sixth year I've had the privilege of providing my annual report to Council. It's a privilege because it's an opportunity to speak on behalf of and pay tribute to the many thousands of health and social care and community wellbeing staff and services, whether working for the council, our statutory partners, the independent and third sector, as unpaid carers, volunteers, or other members of the community. 21-22 was another year dominated by the impact of COVID on the wellbeing of our communities, our most vulnerable residents, our workforce, and indeed all of us. And as if recovery from the devastating impact of COVID wasn't challenge enough, the war in Ukraine and subsequent cost of living crisis has provided a further massive test of our collective resilience. I'm extraordinarily proud of the leadership shown by our relatively new heads of service across children's, adults and tackling poverty services, and the dogged determination of their senior management teams to ensure that we continue to be the best that we can be during a period where health and care services might literally have fallen over. Their staff teams working with partners, the third and independent sectors, unpaid carers, volunteers, other community and co council colleagues have gone over and above time and time again. It has been and continues to be relentless and I keep having to ask for more and they keep on delivering. They remain heroes in every sense of the word. If the past year had been one of relative calm, I'd have been astonished at the amount of innovation and transformation that's taken place. The report outlines numerous examples of such innovation and transformation delivered during a period when maintaining even basic levels of service would have been an incredible achievement. The levels of performance outlined across all our services have in the main either been maintained or in many cases improved. This is nothing short of miraculous and is again a tribute to the hard work, resilience and commitment of all our staff. At the same time, and for the fourth year, we have delivered all of the financial sustainability commitments included within the Council's medium term financial plan. We've worked hard to ensure the link between transformation and innovation, performance and financial sustainability, particularly through our improved focus on prevention. However, a global health pandemic, a return to war in Europe and an associated cost of living crisis is testing us like never before. Before I talk more about our challenges now and looking forward, I do want to encourage you to reflect further on some of the many examples of innovation and best practice highlighted in the report. For example, the success of our early help hubs, which are supporting more and more children and families with an integrated early intervention offer. The Domestic Abuse Hub and the Equilibrium Service, the first local authority to have an accredited domestic abuse perpetrator programme. 
The strengths-based work of our local area, uh, local area coordinators now working with and in communities across the whole of Swansea. The co-production approach to transforming services evidenced through the work of the Swansea P Parent Carer Forum. The work to mitigate the impact of the cost of living crisis by tackling poverty services, working closely with council colleagues and our third sector partners. The new parent-led advocacy approach of the Parents Advisory Network, working with parents who may be at risk of losing their children. Our first in Wales, one-stop shop sensory impairment hub for people with a vision impairment. A sector leading people and place approach to contextual safeguarding to reduce risk to children who may be vulnerable to go missing, exploitation or trafficking, which is at the heart of our Transform Youth Service offer and responded so well to the May Hill incident and was highly praised in the recent Eston inspection. These are just some of the examples of innovation, transformation and improvement. There are many more in the report. I also want to acknowledge one of the case studies highlighted in the report. Case study tells the story of a mum who had been using heroin from the age of 15 right up until her pregnancy last year. Through the hard work and commitment of mum, supported by a skilled social worker and a number of our specialist services, she went from a position of professionals having zero confidence in the safety of her baby, to the baby's name being removed from the child protection register, and they're now living in her own tenancy and successfully bringing up her baby at home in her local community to pay tribute to that mum and to the social worker and all of the other professionals who supported this fabulous outcome. I've either worked in or been responsible for child protection services for the past 25 years. When I watched the video of mum bravely telling her story, crediting the work of our staff, it epitomised everything I mean when I describe our ambition of being the best that we can be. I could stop at this point and offer all of the above as a quite reasonable summary of the performance of your social services in the year 21-22. However, that would mask some serious and systemic challenges that continue to threaten our ability to recover from the shocks to the health and care system in the past two years, and our capacity and resilience to maintain improved services and support to the most vulnerable in our communities going forward. The extraordinary efforts of our staff cannot mask the fundamental fragility of our workforce. Across all disciplines, we cannot recruit and retain sufficient staff to respond as we should to the care and support needs of our population. In particular, we have an acute national shortage of social workers, domiciliary care staff, and a growing lack of placement provision for looked after children. These specific challenges are hampering our ability to catch up on COVID backlogs of assessments in adult social care and leading to less experienced child protection social workers' caseloads being too high. Domiciliary care shortages mean that approximately 200 individuals at any time are unable to access required care at home. Lack of placement sufficiency means that we are struggling to find the right placements for children that need to be looked after. These acute staffing difficulties compound wider issues across the health and care system caused by too few doctors, nurses, therapists, GPs, district nurses and residential care staff. The solutions to these systemic challenges within crucial public services cannot be resolved locally, but require us to work closely with Welsh Government and other partners. But in the meantime, our work to mitigate the impacts on our local communities will continue to test us. At the same time, the cost of living crisis means that like for like care cost of maintaining current levels of service delivery will be between 10 and 15, sorry, will be between 10 and 15 percent more than the previous year. The risk of a real terms cut in public service funding for these crucial services at a point where demand significantly outstrips capacity and an available workforce, work, workforce sorry, is a genuine and very real perfect storm. The past two years have been without a shadow of doubt the most challenging of my career. There is a real possibility that the next few years will present a different but equal level of challenge. We have always been a council that prioritises support to the vulnerable. That will most definitely need to continue to be the case. I know I've gone on a bit, but I do want to finish by acknowledging and thanking the contributions of some significant others. A recently retired Chief Executive, Phil Roberts, who has always been a fierce champion of services to those most in need. 
to uh, a previous councillor, Lloyd, um, and King, Gibbard and Pugh for their leadership of adults, children's and tackling poverty services during the worst of the pandemic. To the chairs and members of the scrutiny performance panels and the previous policy development committee for their constructive support and challenge and flexible approach to running their committees during particularly pressured periods. And a special uh, mention to our previous cabinet member, uh, the then councillor child for many years of leadership in overseeing the transformation of social services and social care in Swansea. And finally, I would repeat my thanks to our new heads of service, their senior management teams, and of course, our remarkable frontline and back office workforce. They should all be very proud. Thank you for indulging me, presiding member. My recommend, uh, the recommendation before you is to receive and approve the annual report of the Director of Social Services 21-22. I'm happy to take any questions. God. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dave, for the report. And I hope everyone's had a chance to, to, to read it um, properly and to, you know, there's incredible information in there. And I particularly thank you for highlighting that case study, which, you know, really brings home the work that our teams do and the difference it can make to individuals' lives. Um, I definitely agree with Dave as he pays tribute to our staff. Uh, but I particularly want to say that, you know, the hard work of our staff and that sort of culture that we've got in, in social services definitely comes from this top. And I'd like to thank Dave in particular particular for his leadership and commitment which is always delivered with compassion and good humour even through these most difficult times. I won't say too much more so I'm you're going to hear from me again when I introduce the market stability report. Councillor Stewart. Thank you Chair. Absolutely um, uh, agree with Councillor Gibbard's comments and I'd like to pay my tribute to Dave and his officers and the teams uh, who've done a remarkable job. We've got to remember that they maintained um, significantly high levels of service for all of our um, uh, people needing care in our communities uh, and in our homes throughout uh, the pandemic. And we should be really proud uh, of what they've done. So thank you, Dave, for that. I just also wanted to say um, I wholeheartedly disagree. And I'm sure this chamber will as well with the statements made just this week by Paul Scully. Uh, and Simon Clark, who said that there was undoubtedly a lot of fat still in local government, which needed to be cut out. Well, uh, I'm sorry, there isn't. If you look at the situation, especially, uh, you know, in local councils across the UK, you will see councils struggling to recruit in order to deliver the services they want to deliver. It just shows how far uh, removed from the planet and the reality some of these ministers are. And, and I think, you know, um, whilst in, instead of removing the cap on bankers' bonuses uh, and uh, taking steps like that, perhaps the government should focus on rewarding those people who go out day in, day out to deliver services to people in need uh, and refocus their priorities on people that Dave has mentioned today, our excellent teams in social care, so they can be properly rewarded for the work they do. Councillor Engine Jones. But, uh, sorry, I would like to thank uh, Dave and the team as well, because I've had occasion over the last year uh, to contact you on a number of quite difficult cases, not all in, 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 in my ward, but I've contacted those councillors concerned uh, where it was outside the ward. But you've been excellent and the whole team and uh, we've got really good resolutions. And in some cases, they were very difficult cases. So thank you very much indeed. Councillor Harley, did you want to speak? Yeah. Um, can I thank thanks Dave for his uh, for the report. I think I think it's fair to say that social services acted above and beyond uh, the call of duty during COVID and since then. I think you've done a, a superb job. Uh, I'll, I would like to say a bit more, but I'll say it in the the report on the. the Councillor Holly, Councillor Sue Jones. Thank you. Can I just add? Jackson Hood Williams is thanks and myself for scrutiny for adults and uh, children's services. And again, thank the staff. It has been a horrendous few years. And but just thanks for your support for us as scrutiny as well. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I want to add my thanks as well um, to David and the team. Um, and what I'm really impressed with, David, is how responsive you have been in, in certain circumstances. Uh, I can remember bringing an issue about domiciliary care to you a, a few months ago, where we all saw fuel prices and the cost of getting around from A to B going up. 
And it was good to see that David and the team have been proactive and already looked at ways in which they could support people with their fuel costs to make sure we didn't lose more valuable staff in those areas. So I, I thought that was a really good and proactive approach to take. Um, th there are other areas I think I may pick up in the later report as well. Um, it was very warming to hear the story that you, you told us about the mum and, and the kid and how they'd be able to, to keep together. I do, what I'd really plead for the council and other people who help support us with funding is we do need to, to do more in substance misuse. There is, a, there is an issue in Swansea that needs to be tackled. Um, and that's working with partners, it's ourselves, and also trying to get the best out of project data. Money has come from central government to address these issues. We want to make sure it comes out on the ground and makes a difference. Yes. Councillor Pugh. Uh, yeah, just to... No. Yeah, just to say thanks uh, to Dave. Look, it's been a really hard couple of years, hasn't it? You know, from the whole team's perspective uh, you know and it is a team and it doesn't matter which department that you're in there and covid showed that and proved it because everybody just rolled their sleeves up and, and and got on with it and they done whatever was needed out there and there was awful decisions that had to be made and there was different ways of working and all the stresses that come with it but it was never a a no or a can't or a won't it, you know everybody um, you, you know, and at all levels, and you've had changes, you've had changes to the services and, uh, you know, all the sort of hard to recruit, all the sort of problems that, that come without COVID as well, do you know what I mean, all the sort of things, and I, I take my hat off to you all, do you know what I mean, it's, it's been our time, and I think you've, you've done fantastically. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Stewart, I'm going to bring you in. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say again, thank you, would um, add to all the comments that have been said. I think the the way the staff have um, worked over the last year or so with COVID has been truly amazing. And but the one thing that I also want to bring to the attention is whilst they've been doing all that, the department has also led the way for the council on its co-production policy, which I certainly think is one of the ways forward for this council. So well done on that as well. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, Chair, I was just because yeah, obviously um, uh, the officer can't move the report, so I'll formally move the report and I'll so second up, please. Can the please, Councillor Gibber, do you go into second or other? Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Gibber. Okay. okay. Are everybody in agreement? Anybody against? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. That's moved. Thank you. We move on to the next item then, and that's the. Uh, revenue, uh, the review of the revenue reserves, and I think it's Mr. Ben Smith. Thank you, presiding member. Um, following on from Mr. Howes, uh, it seems to be that time of year. I do normally follow him straight after this. This is a rather much more dry report in one sense. Very little to draw your attention to in the report itself, uh, but you may want to note one or two things that I do say. So I will come back at the end to the leader and others to potentially move the one recommendation which is set out as uh, the items in section 3.10 and 3.11. Uh, I draw your attention to the table in 2.1, which emphasises that this is still subject to the audit of the draft statement of accounts, but I'm confident that all of the usable reserves will not change as a result of that audit process. A reminder, the general fund balance for the authority is £10 million used as a, an overall contingency sum. Uh, it's relatively lean, given the authority spends net over half a billion pounds a year. Um, so that one is run a relatively light uh, to to enable us uh, to run the earmarked reserves at just under 158 million pounds revenue reserves, uh, which are the, the items that I normally draw your attention to at this time of year, mid year. Uh, there will be further consideration in due course uh, when it comes to budget setting at Council in March. The rest of the table summarises the other reserves that are available and takes you to a total of just over £209 million of usable cash-backed reserves. It is important you note that that is a sizeable sum and is part of the buffers and uh, support that are available to enable Cabinet and Council to make decisions in year. 
um, but they are finite. They can only be used once. Some of them are for only for specific purposes. Some are only for capital. This report only considers the allocation of the reserves. It doesn't refer to the draw from reserves, and I will very briefly mention that in due course. Um, as I say, if I draw your attention then to section 3.10, Cabinet last week did approve uh, a potential allocation of £2.5 million along with some other contingency fund sums into an IT development reserve and that is why other than that item there are no other proposals at this stage in section 3.11 so the table that follows suggests that the earmarked reserves are kept at that £158 million approximately that there is that transfer of £2.5 million between contingency and the IT development fund. But as I draw your attention to in 3.12, whilst it doesn't reallocate or propose to reallocate any other sums, there will be draws from reserves. It is likely that a number of them will be drawn from, including contingency, potentially that IT development fund. There are a number of proposals against the recovery fund as well, but it's still worth me emphasising when there is concern about uh, the finances generally for the public sector and councils, uh, specifically that we go into the position with very strong levels of reserves, uh, which does provide a significant cushion. Uh, consequently, uh, my view is that the reserves are adequate at this point in time, as I'm required to consider and give you advice. But I emphasise in section 4.5 as part of the 23-24 budget setting, there will be a full review of all those earmarked reserves to contest their continued relevance and value for the authority. So I have nothing further to add in terms of technical advice to the report. So unless there are questions, which I will pause for in a minute, I would then otherwise hand back to the leader to potentially move the report if he is so content. Thank you very much, presiding member. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, Mr Smith, a leader. Thank you, Chair. Very little to add to what Mr Smith said other than to just draw members' attention to a couple of key points. Obviously, um, we have, uh, through the uh, last few years, been able to bolster our reserves quite considerably. So we have taken the opportunity where we have surpluses to establish additional reserves. And that is going to be very, very important, especially if the plans outlined this week in Birmingham by the government um, come to pass, because they are suggesting now a 20% cut in departmental spending. Um, and for those of you who uh, uh, may not know, Wales is referred to as a department. Uh, by uh, the Treasury. We are actually a country, as people will know, but in, in government terms in London, we are a department and therefore there's potential for a 20% cut in funding. I do hope it's all noise and bluster uh, because if it does come to pass, then we are looking at a sizable black hole. I think at our last estimate, uh, the leader of WLG, Andrew Morgan, highlighted the black hole even before the mini disastrous budget to be some 500 million. Our latest estimates are in excess of 700 million pound black hole for local government in Wales. That is a £200 million impact by the decisions taken by Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. Now, the government in London is the only government of the UK that has the financial firepower to solve this problem. I really hope they do, but if, if they do not, as they're indicating they won't, then we have uh, luckily bolstered our reserves. We've taken sensible decisions in the last few years to bolster reserves so that we can at least try and protect some of the services here uh, in Swansea Council. However, I would say and repeat what Mr Smith said, any reserves we hold can only be spent once and once they're gone, they're gone. Um, one thing I would say is that if we are uh, again uh, utilising reserves, that is not something new. Uh, members will know over the last year or so, we utilised some £20 million worth of reserves for the Economic Recovery Fund because that was a reserve and that has allowed members to deliver for priorities in their community. So we fully uh, anticipate uh, some use of reserves again this year. Um, but again, uh, we put those reserves away for specific purposes and I would expect the government in London to make sensible decisions so that we do not have to utilise our reserves here in Swansea and that we can fund uh, our services properly. So thank you. And I'll formally move the report at that stage, Chair. Seconder, please. Chris? Mm -hmm. I don't mind second. Sorry, David, yeah. you're going to second it, yeah? Yeah, second uh, the motion. Thank you. Right, Councillor Holly. Right, th th thank you, Presiding Member. Um, I, I asked in scrutiny for the uh, 
finance officer to explain to members there but I, I, I hope if you can do it again and I'm sorry to make him repeat it but where the reserves come from I know the leader has, has spoken about um, uh, we've been exceptionally lucky from grants we've had from the Welsh Government for Covid recovery etc and it, I think it is important that members realise where the reserves come from um, you know I know called before that the uh, financing of local government is a bit of a black art, but you haven't got a hole that you can go into to pick money up. You know, you 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 have that has to come from somewhere, uh, and I th and it is noticeable that th this report is about revenue reserves, but you have actually put in the uh, the the uh, table that you've put in on uh, on page one one eight that they cannot be used to support revenue expenditure capital receipts reserve so it is you know people are being told but if you could again give uh, uh, members a, a, a highlight of where these reserves come from and it's support what the mayor the officer has said uh, the leader has said um, the reality is reserves are just that and once they ends they ends and then we go to cut services now over the last what 15, 20 years, um, we've we've seen uh, budgets being uh, paired back. The fear is that we'll be back in what happened at the financial crash in 2008, and this is going to get worse. So, you know, I think we, we all need to realise that there could be some serious financial consequences. And as has already been said, once these reserves are used, that's it. There's no more. Mr. Smith, do you want to come back in before I call in? Thank, thank you, presiding member. Yes, uh, re referring to Councillor Holly, he did ask that question in scrutiny, and um, the revenue reserves ultimately have come from revenue sources. They have come from predominantly, effectively, underspends reported over the last three years in particular. Thank goodness I have been able to bring to Cabinet at Outturn and Council the statement of accounts revenue underspends of around £100 million over the last three years, but ultimately that is taxpayers' money, local taxpayers' money. I do acknowledge that elements of it have come clearly from the relative generosity of the support through the COVID mechanisms, but those support mechanisms have come to an end. So I think Council was wise to take my advice and to set those sums aside to prepare for challenging times ahead. Uh, members may recall that in previous years I'd indicated that at some point there would be consequences as a result of the, the various bits of turbulence uh, and I think it's come faster and harder than, than, than any treasurer expected. That does provide a degree of comfort but as all speakers have already said and I reiterate whilst they look big on paper they are there once and once they've gone they have gone and as Councillor Holly has indicated there are some which are for other purposes and are earmarked specifically for that and may not be used for a revenue purpose. So it is important that members understand the distinction and I'm sure everyone in the chamber has fully understood the message. They can only be spent magically once. There's there's no everlasting money tree of reserves. Thank you, Mr Smith. Uh, Councillor Will Thomas, please. Thank you, presiding member. Um, ben, apologies uh, if I've asked this um, a number of years ago, but I can't remember the answer. Uh, just with regards to our, our reserves, um, I'm guessing they're all held in uh, Great British Pounds, firstly. Um, and uh, are, are we allowed to hold reserves in gilts or does it all have to be cash? I seem to remember you saying uh, that they had to be cash in the past, but I might be wrong there. So I just uh, would like to know the answer to that. If so, why why can't they be held in guilt? And second question uh, is to either the cabinet member or Ben regarding what is involved in the IT upgrade, please. Thank you. So in terms of the first first one, if I may, presiding member. Absolutely, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, yes, you've asked variations on it, but they're perfectly valid questions. So yes, first of all, straightforwardly, they have to be denominated in sterling. That removes the exchange rate exposure for us. This is, this is the council's cash holdings. This is not the same as the pension fund, which has maximum flexibility to do all sorts of things. Um, in terms of um, short, they, they, they are in, they are short term investments, and I choose to hold them all in forms which are direct cash 
predominantly with the Debt Management Office and Executive Agency of HMRC and HM Treasury. There are some providers of money market funds which are linked to gilts, but obviously they bring with them uh, risks as to the capital value. So we are ultra prudent. We hold it in cash because it's meant to be for short term liquidity. Complete opposite applies on, on the pension fund where we have maximum flexibility to have a range of holdings in, 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 a, in a range of matters. Um, I still, given the current volatility, I'm happy that we do hold it only in cash. We are very um, strict as to our counterparties. Um, and uh, the reason I hold most of it with the debt management office is because you will have seen that there are uh, concerns about some amounts of inter-authority lending between authorities where there is surplus cash. This is only meant to be surplus temporary cash. Um, in terms of the IT development reserve, um, it, 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 there, there will be a report coming to Cabinet in due course and it's linked to other matters. The leader may wish to answer more on that. I, I think those are your questions, Councillor Thomas, but perfectly right to ask them again um, so that members are aware that uh, we keep them in fairly plain vanilla arrangements and thank goodness we do given the current instability. It's never a good look for a treasurer to turn up and say he's lost actual cash. So that's the main reason why I'm ultra prudent on the, on the short term investment side. No, no Icelandic banks, Ember. Yeah, yeah, Chair, just to add to what uh, Mr Smith said, in terms of the IT development fund, we did have a conversation at scrutiny. Um, essentially, as uh, Ms. Uh, Councillor Thomas might know, we are uh, in the process of a major migration uh, in terms of moving to Oracle Cloud. Um, that is a highly complex uh, migration at the moment. It was impacted uh, due to COVID because both uh, our own staff and our supplier staff uh, were at times unavailable. And of course, we had to prioritise uh, the work to get grants out to individuals and businesses, which also further impacted the programme during COVID. Um, so this is uh, an adjustment uh, to prepare for the final phase of the migration, which we hope to see uh, go live early part of next year. Thank you, Councillor Slew. Councillor Rice. Yeah, this is a, a bit of a question and a request. Um, obviously, 4.5, you'd be looking forward to making your plans for next year and for what reserves you'd hold. And the question that I would ask or request I would put is that given uh, the Council's commitment to becoming net zero in 2030 or 2050, how, how you look at it, would it be something that the Council would consider doing, putting the earmarked reserve aside for invest to save uh, policies and ideas for a reserve to meet those targets, especially given some of the exposure you have over the next couple of years, being energy uh, price, uh, crisis and prices going up, it would be definitely worth having a look at uh, a reserve specifically for that. And if you could do, if it's possible and the performance allows it this year, why not have a look at what you're currently going to do in terms of performance and see if you can add it earlier than that? Councillor Rice, do you want to answer that, Mr. Smith? Yes, yeah, so I'll again be very brief. I mean, the reality is it will be for Council to decide in March. Uh, it's perfectly possible for earmarks for reserves to be established for any relevant purpose. They would be relevant purposes, and that is something that can be indeed considered. Uh, I, I think Council will also want to weigh, when it comes to budget decisions, what others might be providing in, way, in terms of support, given that. Uh, uh, higher higher than this council in terms of Welsh government and through the UK government have got their own commitments on on uh, reducing carbon exposure but it's perfectly reasonable for it to be put in the mix if that were something council was minded to do in due course um, the ability to create it early and do it early might be slightly compromised by the current uh, financial position and the position I'd already reported to cabinet but again if it were available and if affordable it is for council to decide on my advice what earmarked it reserves it would wish to establish and that could be established for that purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Thomas asks about uh, why we have to hold the money in cash and not in gilts. Um, given the catastrophic effect the trust government had on gilt yields, would the Treasurer not agree that even if we were able to hold them in gilts, Having a Conservative government in charge of the economy is a damn good reason not to have them. And if that question is too political for the finance officer, perhaps the leader could answer it. 
Uh, presiding member, I'm more than answer to answer half that question, but I think you can guess which half I'm not going to answer. Uh, I refer to the answer I previously gave, which is the risk with guilt, as Councillor uh, Phillips has made clear, is it's the risk of the volatility and there can be capital losses and gains. And it's that that I would not wish to be turning up to this chamber and saying, oops, I made or oops, I lost. And for the avoidance of doubt, the turmoil in recent in the recent week would have been major losses. Um, I clearly won't answer the second part, but uh, I'm, I will defer to see if the leader wishes to answer anything further on that point. Yeah. Do you want to come but back to, in? <laughs> in uh, true uh, Councillor Phillips style, yes, it would be bonkers to uh, hold them in uh, in that circumstance. But I mean, we, we were in a very uh, um, mad position, uh, really, where the Bank of England obviously had to intervene uh, to support uh, largely pension, private pension funds from falling over, where they were doing both buying and selling gilts at the same time. Um, such was the disruption caused by the uh, kamikaze budget um, of Kwarteng and Trust. Uh, I mean, we thought Boris Johnson's government was, uh, uh, you know, a, a crazy organisation. Boy, did we get it wrong when we when we didn't know something even worse was coming along. Thank you. OK, the report has been proposed and seconded. And the recommendation is on page 116, and that's that the Council approves the recommendations made in this report at sections 3.10 and 3.11. Anybody for? Against? Any abstentions? OK, thank you. The, the report is moved. We move on to the next item, and that is... The West Morgan's Regional Market Stability Report 2022, and I believe it's Councillor Gibbard, yeah? Thank you. Sorry, me again. <laughs> um, this is a new report compiled by local authorities with involvement from the Health Board, citizen and carer representatives, and then collated into this regional version. This is the first one that we've had to do. I'm very grateful to all the officers involved because it's been no easy task. Um, all this, a lot of the services are, and the different organisations measure things differently. And of course, COVID has created additional volatility. Um, this will now be combined with the population needs assessment and used to develop the area plan for the West Morgan Regional Partnership Board. It has been uh, approved by the RPB and Cabinet, and that's why it's coming here today. Um, as you will note, and as um, Dave referred to in his report earlier, the report outlines many of the challenges currently facing the care sector. Um, we're not alone in this in West Morgan, of course. Um, particularly concerning, as I'm sure we are all aware, are the workforce shortages, um, the demand for domiciliary care and children's placements, especially for children and young people with complex needs. It highlights the future challenges of an ageing population, longer living, increasing projected numbers of people with dementia, and concern about whether the sector will be able to respond to um, commit, uh, Welsh Government's challenging but worthy commitment to eliminate profit from children's services. And when this report was written, of course, we weren't fully aware of the cost of living crisis, which is makes things even more difficult. Um, to end on a more positive note, the report does um, outline the partnership work and the development of programmes to respond to these challenges. Um, and of course, these numbers on the page reflect to real relate to real people our staff families carers children disabled people older people um so a big thank you to everyone in, involved in in social care and our families and our residents for, for working together in this difficult period okay can i have a oh i need a proposal first please and then a second and then a proposing seconder rob uh, th thank you presiding member Having read this report and tried to understand what is below it is is the the reality of of, of what this stability report is about. It, it it really is where, as a two authorities, the Sonzi and and Ethan Batal, but where are we uh, in our care sector? Where are we, and 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 how are we going to respond to the future? Because one of the things it doesn't actually say is what financial costs are likely to be. I'm afraid that any report about stability has to have that in it. It mentions, you know, um, care homes, it mentions hillside, it mentions residential care, uh, domiciliary care, etc. 
But we need to understand what this is about. Um, the cabinet member mentioned the cost of living increase, and obviously this report took some time to, to, to actually write. So I can well understand that considering in the last 10 days, we've had a tsunami of information from Westminster uh, about the financial consequences of that budget. So they, that couldn't be in here, but I am a bit surprised that considering the health service and the two other social services, that there should have been some indication of what the likely costs are and what the outcomes are likely to be. Because I think that that what should actually be concerning the people of um, the people of Swansea and, and Ethan Botalba is because the reality of what this report is saying is that to have a stable market, a stable uh, facility for care, for residential care, for domiciliary care, and 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 for the adult care of all sorts constituents, we need to have stability in the, uh, to, to pay people and to have organisations to look after um, our, our elderly and our, those uh, our vulnerable people. So I, I would ask the cabinet member if she could go away and come back and, and give us some idea of what the likely outcome of costs are going to be. Obviously, that can't be done straight away, and I expect that you know that it would take months and more, more than weeks. But I think we need to understand that, and I think all members, all elected members, both in this council and other council, but on top of all that, we need the NHS to understand what the consequences of the stability report is and what the financial consequences are likely to be. And I think I would ask the cabinet member if she can, at some stage, come back with a report on that. Yeah, just to respond to that, I, obviously I've, I've come in slightly late in the process, but I, is, I believe the parameters of the report are set down by, by Welsh Government, that's what we're responding to. And then that, uh, in addition to, as I said, the population needs assessment, which is going on, will form the area plan. Um, and so costings and things like that, I, I'm assuming will come in at that stage, but I will um, um, come come back to you Well, when, when that develops. It's a, a five-year plan, which is sort of just being, being kicked off now. We had an RPB meeting yesterday, so I'm sure We'll uh, have more details, and it's not just—it's not just for the authorities; it's for the health board as well. So, Councillor Ben, Councillor Rice. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to pick up a, a couple of issues uh, and items there. It's probably as much a, a, a part of understanding them than anything else. On seven point nine, which is on page two hundred and twelve, it talks about domiciliary care for older adults, and in section eight, it talks about market sufficiency. And um, I was quite confused to see that we're providing a lot less hours than we previously had in domiciliary care. Um, I think it's dropped by about 37%. Where naturally, I would have thought that we'd probably have more of a demand for domiciliary care than ever. So I, I just want to try and understand that. And the, the other area that seems to be sort of, again, not obvious in the report is the support that we're giving for substance misuse and um, substance harm. I'm not. I can't get the figures up off the top of my head. Could I come back with a written a written yeah. response on that? Thank you, Councillor Phillips. I could you just follow on from uh, Councillor Holly's point? Uh, I think his question is a little unfair to the cabinet member. Who 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 can possibly tell what the impact of the uh, cost of living increase is, particularly that in regards to fuel, and particularly the impact of that on the viability of care homes that local authorities throughout the United Kingdom are now having to rely in order to be able to provide and deal with this provision. Ask the cabinet member, I don't know, this, is this a poison chalice of a question? I don't know, I'm really sorry. Um, does the, not the current crisis provide us and government with the opportunity to finally get to grips with the reconciliation, the, the joining, the conjoining of health and social care? into one particular service. Health is limited by the inadequacy of beds from which people can be discharged. And I've personally been dealing with that uh, myself with some with friends. Um, and until we can get to grips with that and the, the, the way that the service is delivered for those for people who can't be discharged home, the way they 
we don't have the places for them to be discharged home and, and no alternative proper um, provision. Is it not time that we had some sort of integrated service that would be able to do, deal with that properly, uh, financially viable and with the dignity for the people involved? Um, yes, <laughs> yes. Obviously, it's, it, it, and that integration is is underway and working working well in in the RPB at the moment. But obviously, early days and there's a lot, an awful lot to do. Is a huge huge area, as you say. But there's sort of specific programs of work which are being addressed collaboratively, and that's definitely the way forward. Okay, the report has been proposed and seconded, please. So I'm going to move to the recommendation, and it's on 144. And that it's recommended that Council notes the Regional Partnership Board approve the Regional Market Stability Report on the 7th of July 2022, and that it approves the Regional Market Stability Report attached to Appendix A. Can I have a show of hands? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. That was carried. The next item is the councillor's ICT allowance policy, and that's over to uh, Mr. Hugh Evans, please. Thank you, presiding member. Um, firstly, which is called the councillor's ICT allowances policy, it does include the statutory co-opted uh, members. The amend amended the amendment I'm proposing this evening is to raise the co-opted members' ICT allowance from 20% of what a councillor gets to 50%. The reason for this uh, amendment is to closer align them uh, with, with the, the technology and the hardware they need to carry out their roles, the price of computers, etc. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a small financial uh, increase, but very necessary to, to, to manage the workload. Mr. Evans, uh, yeah, I fully support uh, the report. Um, you know, we are relying more and working agilely. It makes really good sense that we, we support this. So happy to move. Can I have a seconder, please? Happy to second. Okay. No. Then we move to the recommendation and it's on page 246. And it's recommended that the amendments to paragraphs 3.2 and 4.3 and the consequential changes to paragraph 6.8 and appendix 1 of the councillor's ICT allowance policy May 2022 and beyond together with any other consequential changes be approved and the second part is the amended version be published on the council's website and shared with all the councillors and statutory co-opted members can I have a show of hands for please any against any abstentions OK, that's moved. We move on to the next item. I'm going to have to leave the chamber, please. So I think, uh, Councillor Lloyd, are you coming to take the chair? No. I'll have to take a vote uh, quickly. It's all right. If you leave, and I'll, I'll carry on from there. It's OK. Um, in the absence um, of a chair and vice chair of council, uh, I need a nomination for um, someone to chair the meeting for this item. For this item, Chair, I, I reckon, I, sorry, I nominate Councillor Paul Lloyd. Any other nominations? Can I have a second of a Councillor Lloyd? All those in favour of Councillor Lloyd chairing this item? There were anyone against? And any abstentions? Over to you, Councillor Lloyd. OK, thank you very much. Um, you see agenda item 14 there. Um, it's one recommendation is before us. I'll come in. That's OK. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. It's it's my report and I have a bit of a hospital pass there to Councillor Lloyd. Apologies for that. Um, the Standards Committee met yesterday and interviewed uh, the candidate um, to be a community town councillor representative on the Standards Committee, which we must have um, by law. Uh, the, the one candidate, uh, sorry, the, the Standards Committee recommended uh, Town Councillor Carlo Rabaiotti of Gusainen Town Council to be appointed. Uh, it's, it's up to Council to make that decision. Uh, Councillor Rabaiotti is, is, is 
application form was emailed to you all last night, so you're aware. Um, he's been a town councillor for some five or six years in Cassinan, and if you agree to appoint him to the committee, his term of office will end at the local government elections in 2027. However, council may decide at that time to uh, reappoint him for one further term. His appointment is also subject to him remaining a town councillor for the duration. I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, the chair, happy to move. Yes. I give somebody a second, please. Yeah, you can take the vote on that and then sh show of hands, please. Thank you all very much. Any and against? Any abstentions? No. Thank you. That's carried. Thank you. Uh, just to mention, uh, monitoring officer, that uh, oh, she's left. <laughs> that um, Kelly Roberts uh, didn't have time to declare an interest, so she's taken herself out to the meeting, and we'll rejoin for that item. Just call everyone back in if you give us a moment. Folks, we're on. Okay. Oh, she is coming back. And I, I'm not sure if uh, Councillor Jenkins has left, and, but I think Councillor Stevens is on his way back in as well. Councillor Roberts, I understand you, you need to declare an interest in the last items if you were to do so now. Uh, yeah, I did have my hand up, but you'd already started, so I left the meeting. Uh, but I'll declare uh, an interest in that item and I'll fill out the form. But I did leave. Thank you. Do I need for wait for Councillor Stevens, uh, Mr. Evans, or can I proceed? Oh, he's back now. It's okay. Okay, the next item is the recruit. No, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. We're on membership of committees, and I see Councillor David Hopkins, please. Yeah, thanks, Presiding Member. I know that um, Hugh Evans has got an amendment, but I also got an amendment to 2.1 on the Corporate Parenting Board. Uh, it says to remove Wendy Lewis, Councillor Wendy Lewis. Could I suggest that that be amended? And that should read uh, removal of uh, Elliot King, Councillor Elliot King. And with the amendment that uh, Hugh Evans has got, I move the report. Do my amendment quickly. Uh, the, the amendment that's been passed to me, as he looks for it rapidly, here it is, uh, on the climate change CDC to remove Erica Kirshner and add Hannah Lawson. Thank you. Chair, happy to second. Second it, thank you, consistent. Okay, we'll uh, vote on it. So, all voting, four hands, show hands, please. Any abstentions? Okay, that's moved. Thank you. Move on to the councillors' questions. And the first question is from Councillor Lyndon Jones. Please. Great. Thank you, uh, Presiding Member. Uh, if I could add, obviously there are problems with the system, and I'm quite pleased that the uh, that that is 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 ongoing. And uh, uh, because I know I get uh, uh, people saying that they get taken off to the wrong department very often, and it certainly happened to me uh, on one or two occasions. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, what it does do then is you go back to the switchboard and it puts extra pressure on our staff there. So, uh, and I always feel a bit embarrassed when that happens to me, uh, you know, because of the work that, you know, they're all pretty busy. So I'm pleased that that is actually happening. But as I say, that uh, it is, it is needed. Thank you. Was there a question, Councillor Jones? I was responding to the... Ask a supplementary question if you're... Right, OK. Member agree. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyways, I think we got there in the end, the presiding member. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the comments, understanding that this system <laughs> is under continuous improvement. Um, just to give some statistics, so 75% uh, of requests were recognised at the first attempt uh, and routed to the system accordingly. 5% uh, were incorrectly recognised and 20% grammar not available on the system and just some interesting facts because we do have uh, with the um, system recognizing words and I think Welsh uh, language firstly and foremost and Welsh names can be very difficult but I, I note that Robert, Robert Francis David uh, is not in the system uh, as opposed to Davis and so we will update and correct that accordingly uh, and there are certain minor errors where people are actually requesting the wrong name of the officer or the wrong department things like birth register disability installations so we, we're trying to perfect the system so that it reflects the public might not always know the correct name for the correct service or department. So it is ongoing improvements, uh, but your comments are duly noted. Thank you, Councillor uh, Presiding Member, can I declare an interest in question three and leave the room when it takes place? Okay, question two then is from Councillor Mike Lewis, please. Mike Lewis. Second question. No supplementaries. No supplement. Thank you. Pardon? No, I can start. He's just declared an interest, personal prejudice, so he's decided to leave the chamber. Okay. Question three, it's uh, from Councillor Mary Jones, please. Mary's not here, so I was going to ask the questions. I've actually got three. Um, considering your response, has the council provided advice to staff as to how they can claim under the tax system? As the increasing um, cost of fuels is going to, to affect them if they're working from home. My second question is, is the council aware that um, all employees can now legally pay up to six pound a week to workers to work from home and it's a payment that's tax free and the third question is how does the freedom of staff to work in the office if they want to meet the council's accommodation strategy would there be sufficient space for all staff to work in their offices if they all wish to or would they be forced to work elsewhere, such as at home or some other alternative? Ms. Hopkins. Yeah, firstly, I thank the question. What I would, would say on, on, on my response is obviously, I thought on the, particularly the second question, I thought that was more of a tax, um, a tax of, of a thing rather than an allowance. I thought that was from HMRC, where that six pound can be claimed rather than it be your right. But I certainly will look into that and, and come back to you. On the, on the strategy, what I would say, we've done considerable work with the trade unions and, and a wider staff to look at the, our accommodation strategy. But it, but to be honest, I think it's a matter of choice. Um, and I'm confident that we've got the workspace. If you look at the Guild Hall at this particular time, to be honest, we we're in this building very much on your own and there's huge capacity that, that can be reached. And there's still quite considerable uh, capacity over the Civic Centre. But also we're looking, when you look at our strategy going forward of the new hubs that we're looking at, you know, members of staff in the future probably could look at things like libraries, could be working not just, you know, not just in these buildings, but we've got housing offices and other facilities within, within our stock that, that our members of staff could be working in. So I'm quite confident with the freedom of choice and our agile working policy and our partnership working that we've got with the trade union, we probably could could facilitate that um because far more people will weigh up the right to turn the eating on or spend all that money in pet while coming back for the work just giving them that choice to do that and i think that choice is important when we did go actually when we did do all these things we did have that consultation with all our members of staff and it was really really in, massively way towards agile working everybody sees the, the benefit of that so 
No, I, I'm reasonably comfortable at accommodation starting if you can accommodate that. On the first question, I missed it, sorry, I, I couldn't get it. Nice. Um, has the council provided a clear advice to staff as to how they can claim under the tax system? Do they know? Sorry, yes, we have. I can confirm that advice has been given um, on, I believe, blogs as, as well as, um, as throughout communications throughout. And that's all members of staff. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Jones. Yeah, thank you, presiding member, and thank you to the cabinet member for the reply. He's, I think he sort of answered what I was going to ask. The last part of the, his reply really is there is no plan to provide financial reimbursement for energy bills, given that the choice, I know he's used the word choice, will remain for staff to work from home or a council workplace over the coming months. Now, given that the, I've come across uh, some sections, I know audit um, and I think legal as well, actually share working space and they, shall we say, can come in for two or three days a week. Um, where is the choice there? Because the, the other two days, I assume they have to work from home. What I would say, business need is, is critical in this. It's, it's not just about you know, what's good, obviously. It is the business need. So the business needs, see if people can come in more often. It can happen. And there is, as I said, there is plenty, plenty of um, space within this building to do so. But I'm, I'm confident that when we've done this consultation, because it was in wide consultation, when I say that we're not looking at that, I, what I will say, there's ongoing discussions with the trade union movement, and the leader himself has raised this, this issue particularly. We need to monitor that. We need to look at it. So it might be saying that you know we're not in a position now, but things will alter through negotiations with trade unions, that we might be looking at it, but not at this particular time, I can assure you. But it's all about that choice. About, don't forget... Spending money to come in is substantial amount of money on petrol and fuel costs. It is that choice. They might, to lots of people, it might be far better to work from home rather than get in the car and come in here. So it's that choice about petrol coming in or not, you know, and the heating costs. So it's flexible and to, to suit each and every individual. Yet again, I will say business needs is critical to that. Sorry, could I just clarify that? Um, so they've got a choice to actually come in, but if they come in on the day that they're not allotted for their office, they'll have to work somewhere else. I can remember it. What if it was in the audit committee where we talked about security work, and particularly with, um, I think we were talking about auditors and, and everything else when I was in in the audit committee when that was mentioned. What was said, yes, they got allocated days and, and secured offices to discuss, to look at these things, they, and the allocation was two to three days. But I, what I think, I, what I would say, if they do need extra time, we will look at every every avenue to accommodate, particularly with security, as cyber security, when you said at the time, if it needs to be office space, then we will. But let me just say, we haven't just done this agile working. This has been with us for some time. So I'm quite, I do get the business about high fuel costs, but it, we have got no protection of these high fuel costs. We're doing everything we can to work with the employees to support our employers through these times. And if it means we will look at, we look at something, we will. But at this moment, we haven't got the money to do it. Unless central government steps up and gives us the money, we can't, we cannot do, you know, we, the demands are huge on this authority. So what I would say, it's not, let's leave it open. We will work with our trade union. We've got a fantastic relationship with them. I'm a widest staff on consultation. If it's a problem, we will revisit it. But at the moment, I'm confident that, you know, it is that matter of choice. Mr. Stewart. Chair, if I can just add to what uh, Councillor Hopkins has said, which is absolutely right. I think the, the inference, if I got it right from Councillor Jeff Jones's question, was that we were forcing staff to work from home when they had the opportunity to come in. That's not my understanding. What we can't guarantee is that everybody can work from the exact desk they want to work from every day because we have for some time, as Councillor Hopkins said, had agile working. So staff do share desk, desk space and that is not something new. It's been in for many years. I think in terms of a modern workforce and a, and a model, modern approach to working, what we always try and do, subject to business need, is to allow people to work from home where they want to but to work from other locations. And that's where the effort will be going shortly, is to look again at what we can do to allow people to use 
buildings that may be public buildings accessible closer to their homes. So even if they don't want to work in their own home, they may be able to work at a location closer than their, their actual stated place of work. So we're being extremely flexible and, and I would hope being very supportive to staff. I think Councillor Hopkins made the right point as well. For many families, actually, the cost of them staying at home may be greater than the cost of them coming into work uh, and paying the fuel bills because of course fuel for cars if especially if you're doing a long journey 30 miles a day each way might be a considerable cost to to an individual so therefore working from home might be the cheaper option for them so again we're looking at all of those but it's about choices about supporting the work workforce to make the right choices for them sorry please i do can i just say can i can i yes, stop I, you a second because Mr. Smith wants to come in, so it might be for clarification if you just let Mr. Smith. I just wanted to, you know, reply. There wasn't an inference that they were they were forcing. I just wanted clarification how you actually got over the problem of people actually if they've got a lot of time in the office. What what you know? How do you actually utilise that time when they come in? Yeah, I think that's a that's a misunderstanding. I think we, we're not saying to people you must do three days a week at home and two days in work. We have a conversation with a member of staff about what is the best arrangements for them, based as well on business need. There may. Be I mean, depending on the job you do, you may have to be physically in a certain area for a certain amount of time. But it's always that business conversation. What we can't do is to say you're sitting at that specific desk on that specific day. There is a way in which hot, hot, you know, um, agile working works, which is that you may not actually sit in the same seat every day. Mr. Smith, do you want to come in, please? Thank you, Presiding Mumbo. It was, it was on the middle one, given Councillor Hopkins had, had, had referenced it to confirm that £6 a week we referenced is a tax relief. It's not £6 in cash. It used to be £4. It was uplifted for 2021 and 21 22 only to £6. It is reclaimable from HMRC. My understanding is you've got up to four years as an individual to make that choice on claiming it or not. Crucially, and that perhaps feeds into some of the other bits of the discussion subsequently, HMRC's position changed from 5th of April 2022. Claims for tax relief with no evidence and an automatic claim is now only available if you must work from home. And clearly we're not saying people must work from home. So I thought I would interject because it provides an answer on the, the technicals for the, the middle part of the question. And I think it does have some relevance to some of the other parts of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. Uh, question four then and that from Councillor Lyndon Jones. Yeah, no, no further question. Thank you. Chris Four. On which just a, a quick supplementary. Has a cabinet member considered um introducing plastic recycling for commercial um companies? Uh, because at the moment it is provided by private providers. Uh, but it's not provided by the council, and that would make a big difference to the number of people recycling. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I do believe that under the new legislation with the Welsh Government that we will be looking into plastics. Um, what we've got to remember is um, DRS might be coming in, so we'll be looking at it when we review our full plastics. Right. Thank you. We move on to the next question and then as Councillor Sam Bennett. Well, thank you for presiding member and thank you um, cabinet member for your response. Um, BBC Wales reported seven councillors providing free school meals to children um, under the age of seven and a further three councillors extending provision to receptions, um, reception year one and year two. Can the cabinet member explain the assertion that Swansea Council is ahead of other councils? Okay, can I start presiding member? It's not a it's not a competition and we are rolling out the free school meals as best we can and as fast as we can across all schools, all primary schools in Swansea. That's our objective. There is a programme that we've identified a number of schools where additional work is required to enable us to deliver uh, free school meals to all primary school pupils and that is what we're doing. Thank you. The next question is from Councillor Wendy Lewis. No supplementaries. The next question is from Councillor Wendy Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, thank you, Cabinet Member, for your response to this question. 
I have to say it's very, very positive that this uh, installation of solar panels is something that the council is going to get, engage in on, on older council properties. And I think what is particularly uh, interesting and beneficial is that it looks as though the council are providing batteries because this, I think, is something that is really important. And I have to say, in my ward, there have been 80 new houses built with solar panels, but no batteries. And you can perhaps understand that there are limitations. So I just wondered, in terms of the pilot schemes, you say there are going to be 12 pilot schemes. Where are they going to be across Swansea? And have you any idea at this point in time how much each house will cost or is it going to be dependent on the size of the house? You know, I'm not sure of the technicalities. Is there a general figure, overall figure, anything that you can indicate? Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to Councillor Fitzgerald for the question. Um, just to outline really first of all that uh, the HRA business plan contains only £26 million, which is a relatively small amount of funding over four years. Um, we've anticipated a need for £870 million to do every council house in Swansea. So just to give you an idea of the gravity of the financial resource situation, uh, I cannot give you, I'm afraid, uh, costings. I can give you indicative costings, which I will give you in writing. But you've asked for the information about the 12 sites. If I can just... Uh, also outline before I list those areas that they have been selected for purpose and for reason. So many of the areas are off gas properties. Some of them are already in our development plan for refurbishment, for example, enveloping. So while we've got them in the capital programme programmed in, it made sense to then do the batteries and the solar at the same time, less disruption for the tenants and also targeting those properties which need to be uh, made far more thermally efficient than they currently are. So the areas uh, selected using that rationale are Gansocht, Craig Kevin Park, Valindra, West Cross, Borspit. Uh, sorry if I butchered the pronunciation of that to the West Cross councillors. Uh, Sketty Park, Penarail, Garden City, Forest Park, Trashloin, Wanarloith, Cumberty Cairo, Morriston and Clidach. I'm happy to give that table for members' information uh, as a written response, presiding member. Happy to take any further follow-up questions. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Further questions? No? Okay, we move on to the next one then, and that's from Councillor Chris Hall. Thank you, presiding member. Um, the, it says the full list of sites and buildings will be provided separately. I don't think we've had them. I have asked them, them to be provided. Uh, I think um, I won't ask any supplementaries until I see the list. Thank you. Could, could I give an apology? I thought that list should have been circulated. In fact, I thought it had been circulated. So take an apology for myself. I will chase that up. But I, what I will say, I was ensured that we get that list circulated as a matter of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that completes the agenda for this evening, folks. So thank you all for your attendance. And again, safe journey home. Thank you.